So um, thank you. I'm, I'm really delighted to be um, to be invited today to talk about um, my research. Um, and it was a bit of a, it, it was exciting. It was a bit of a challenge to think about what specifically um, to talk to you about today. And I hit on the idea of talking about risk um, and the role of risk in using um, outdoor spaces um, with young people for health and well-being benefits. Um, sorry, I'm just going to start, there we go, starting my timer, so uh, I know where I'm at. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to draw on my research background, particularly my experience researching school-based facilitation of outdoor learning activities, and my experience from observation um, of non-school-based interventions such as care farms. But in the way that I think about risk and engaging young people in risky activities, it's impossible for me not to draw on my own experience as a parent. I'm a mum of five under 11 year olds, and we've been living and home educating in the Yorkshire Dales for the last year. Um, so the caveat there is also if you hear any strange noises in the background, I, prob I promise no one's being tortured. Um, that's the kind of normal background noise in our house at the moment. Um, and most of the illustrations in my talk um, are of my kids here in Cumbria, so uh, you'll get a little taster of, of what life's like. I wanted to use this talk today as an opportunity to think through the concept of risk in outdoor activity. I think that, you know, there's all sorts of exciting different projects going on um, that I've heard about a bit over the last couple of days that are going to be discussed um, you know, today, and I'm very aware of the fact that engaging with young people with nature does not necessarily mean taking them out into wild spaces or even taking them out into outdoor green spaces. Um, but given the sort of brevity, the necessary brevity of my talk today, that's that's what I'm focusing in on. I'm specifically interested in the way in which risk mediates young people's relationship with outdoor green space and the potential for outdoor green space to provide benefits for young people's mental health and well-being. And I was wondering here um, how much detail I should be going into kind of to frame or set a context for this session around nature and mental um, well-being more broadly. And I was a bit torn between the idea that people that are at this conference are probably very familiar with this literature um, and the idea that perhaps some people will be here because they're interested in other aspects of young people's engagement with nature um, and, and might quite appreciate some sort of background um, information, background ideas about what the mental health benefits of spending time in nature are. Um, so as a compromise, um, and we'll see if my slides are working. Uh, no, then there we go. Great. Um, so just very quickly, there is loads and loads of research out there showing all sorts of positive benefits and positive um, kind of links between spending time in nature and also having views of nature and improved outcomes for mental health and well-being. So that might be... Um, having um, lower levels of anxiety, having increased emotional resiliency, um, increased levels of self-discipline um, amongst children, reducing stress, um, improved symptoms um, of ADHD. Um, and there's also, I think quite sort of starkly, quite interestingly, um, lots of research out there that just shows that views of green space can have really positive mental health and well-being outcomes. Um, so, for example, um, people requiring um, less analgesia during medical procedures or after um, surgery, if they've got views um, of green space or even pictures of green space. Um, and images of green space have been shown to reduce tension in offices as well. Um, so I think, however, it's one thing to kind of know that that literature is out there. And I want to say here that 
what is really clearly missing from um, that previous slide is any citations. Um, and really the reason here, it's a bit of a cop out, but there are just so many, um, so many publications out there. If you use Go Google Scholar um, and enter search terms around mental health and benefits of nature, benefits of outdoor green space, then you'll be overwhelmed with papers that are kind of describing this link. But actually, I think what's really important, both as practitioners and as researchers who care about facilitating young people's um, engagement with nature, is having some kind of understanding of the pathway of, of what leads from or, or the mechanisms that are occurring that mean that spending time looking at or being in these spaces leads to a positive mental health outcome kind of what's what's going on there what's what's the logic and this is an issue that has been explored from a lot of different disciplinary backgrounds um, particularly environmental psychology um, and various sort of qualitative social science um, disciplines and the language we use to explain these pathways that to explain the logic of why green spaces are beneficial does vary between disciplines, you know, because the specific thing we're interested in, the specific thing that we're trying to explain is going to be a bit different depending on the disciplinary background we come from. But there's this one kind of group of ideas around terms like biophilia um, and psychoevolutionary theory that you're probably familiar with, but you know, very basically, these theories say that throughout the vast majority of human evolution, people have um, been living really closely in nature. People have been living outdoors. People have been directly using their hands to collect their food outside. The kind of daylight hours have been spent outdoors. And living indoors and living in urban areas is a really modern phenomenon. It's a contemporary, um, it's a contemporary situation which our bodies and our minds are not developed to deal with. And therefore, modern life causes stress. We are overstimulated. And so biophilia and psychoevolutionary theory are about the fact that we have an innate need um, to spend time in outdoor green space, that that's the kind of natural habitat for humans, and therefore being in those spaces is kind of relaxing, it's centering. Um, attention restoration theory is a similar idea, it's about the fact that modern life is overstimulating, and that natural spaces provide exactly the right level of stimulus um, to kind of keep us interested, keep our mind engaged, but not kind of overexciting, not overcomplicating what's going on in our heads. I'm a geographer um, and in geography we talk about therapeutic landscapes and that's the idea um, that being in nature has physical and mental therapeutic benefits for people, that um, specific, places, pl specific places have been assigned a kind of cultural idea of wellness. And so as a group of people, um, as a society, we understand that some places are going to offer us opportunities for feeling relaxed and, and that's why we go to particular places so there's something in there that's about the landscape and something in there about kind of what we understand to be the benefit of the landscape and a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy then I suppose. I really like the therapeutic tasks theory. Now therapeutic tasks which I think is kind of closely linked to assemblage theory is about the idea that it's not just being in the environment that's important, but it's who we're there with, what we are doing in that space. So therapeutic tasks and assemblage theories lead to this idea that mental health and well-being in natural environments is this kind of comes from a confluence of us as individuals being in a landscape that we find relaxing, doing an activity that we enjoy, that sort of interests us, um, but doesn't 
over kind of um, overstimulate us. And the social environment is also seen as being important. Who we're with, those kind of social relationships um, that occur within the spaces. So in other words, the sort of therapeutic tasks theory would suggest that a young person isn't going to get a mental health benefit out of just being plonked in a landscape, however beautiful that landscape is, that they need to be there with people that are going to have a positive impact and engaged in some kind of activity, which could be meditation, it could be relaxing, it could be, you know, not particularly doing anything at all, or it could be a productive um, thing that they're doing. However, what is really important to bear in mind, and this is something that I was pleased to hear coming up yesterday, is that outdoor green spaces, outdoor blue spaces are not necessarily therapeutic. They're not necessarily um, relaxing or positive spaces to be in um, for everyone. Um, for some young people, and for adults facilitating young people's access, be that parents or teachers or youth workers, outdoor green spaces can be stressful or scary places. And this might be as a lack of, due to a lack of experience in these environments, or due to a perception of these places um, as uh, scary, as threatening. And that might be a threat of tangible dangers like strangers or criminal activity or poisonous plants or drowning. Or it could be a kind of more mythical fear, a fictitious idea about what might be hiding um, in sort of dark and hidden spaces. And this is really what I want to focus on for the rest of the talk. The way in which nature-based spaces are perceived as dangerous or scary spaces and the way that this perception and understanding of risk can inhibit young people's opportunities for benefiting from engagement with nature. I particularly want to focus on the way in which outdoor green spaces or particularly young people in outdoor green spaces are constructed as risky by those responsible for facilitating access. And particularly, I'm thinking here about schools and other youth work agencies. So in an institutional context, when we talk about risk, this is typically synonymous with danger or threat. And risk is something that is seen as being need as seen as needing to be minimized in order to reduce the potential for physical harm to a child and to reduce the harm that a child could do to themselves or to others. And therefore, we can see risk minimization strategies as ways of reducing potential pain or suffering to children. However, more pragmatically, these can also be about reducing the threat of litigation from an accident or reducing sort of outside intervention that might occur as the result of a near miss. Now, I want to stop sort of very momentarily here um, to just acknowledge that the language that we use around risk and the, the language that I found myself thinking about and using as I wrote this talk is really difficult because risk is highly subjective. What I think of as an acceptable level of risk may well be different from the level of risk involved in an activity that you think is acceptable. And that's going to be based on the extent to which we value the activity um, and the extent to which we sort of value or are concerned about the potential harm. So we might, um, as two people in a room, we might agree that the risk of something happening is a one in a hundred chance but I might say well I'm happy to accept that level of risk and you might say no that's that's too high and another reason why sort of discussions around risk are so difficult is because risk is dependent on an individual and contextual material factors so something that is dangerous 
for me might not be dangerous for you and vice versa. The risk, the actual risk is going to be different from each person. So, um, you know, to use this picture of my daughter in the playground, um, I think what she's doing there would be really dangerous for me to do. Um, if I slipped doing that, I could easily end up with a broken wrist or a torn something um, and not be able to look after the kids for the next week. Um, for my sort of supple and flexible seven-year-old daughter, that activity carries very very little risk and therefore risk calculations are going to include both expert knowledge about what an activity involves about the kind of level of expertise of the people doing the activity but also personal preference about whether we think that the level of risk that might be objectively kind of calculated is worth taking so I've kind of come up with a wee risk cycle here. According to Ulrich Beck, who's a sociologist who works on risk, as a society, we tend to fear unknown large scale events more than common everyday events. So we fear um, nuclear explosions more than we fear being hit by a car, even though we know kind of objectively that being hit by the car is actually a much more likely way for us to die. So a lack of familiarity, a lack of knowledge um, leads to a sort of perception of fears that may actually be greater than the way in which we would perceive, the way in which we would value a particular risk if it was a risk that was well known to us. So if we perceive an outdoor green space to be kind of risky, we worry that there might be mine shafts to fall into, there might be um, unpleasant strangers lurking in the trees, there might be poisonous plants that the kids we're working with um, might bite into. Um, then we our kind of natural reaction, our initial reaction might be to try and avoid that place. Let's, let's not go to this dangerous place. And then we continue with a lack of familiarity of that place and also perhaps a, a lack of familiarity and unease that spreads to other outdoor green places, other, other woodlands. And we continue to lack knowledge of how to access that. And that increases both the real risks to ourselves and others. If I don't know a woodland, I don't know how to behave there. Um, I'm more likely to wear the wrong things on my feet. I'm more likely to accidentally tread on an adder um, than if I know that space. And it also leads to an increase in imaginary dangers. It leads to an increase in my fear about what might be lurking there because I don't know. So my imagination takes hold. And then that leads to an increased perception of risk and on and on in this vicious circle of, of not accessing these spaces. Um, and then I've just put, sorry, um, this is me having to kind of move different boxes around the screen to, to see what I've um, written different places, right. So decreased knowledge and increased perception of risk can also lead to increase in blame culture and increased likelihood of litigation. So if parents are unfamiliar with these spaces, they may well um, be even more concerned about what you're doing with their young people in these places, um, and therefore even more worried about, um, or even more cross about sort of minor injuries that young people might sustain in these places. So what are the benefits of risk? Why is this a problem? So taking a risk is challenging yourself to do something new. Activities are only risky if you don't know that you can do them. Once you've done something new a few times, you become proficient and therefore you learn a new skill. You develop, therefore, your self-confidence and self-esteem. But it's not always about saying yes. Allowing young people to develop their own risk management strategies, allowing young people to choose when they want to say no, when they want to avoid a risk, is going to help them to um, develop their own risk management, their own decision making skills. And it demonstrates trust and respect between you as the facilitator and the young people. And if you feel an expert adult trusts your judgment, 
then again, you're going to develop your self-confidence and your self-esteem and become a better decision maker and therefore better at individual risk management. So this was a quick sort of example I worked through about allowing a young person to climb a tree. They're going to develop their tree, climb ab tree climbing ability. They're going to develop their own physical um, expertise at doing that activity. They're going to develop knowledge of that environment. They're going to develop knowledge of trees, about what, what they feel like, what they look like, what they smell like. And they're also going to develop a positive relationship with the person who's allowed them to do that because you've asked them, you've allowed them to do a fun activity and you've trusted them to do that activity sensibly. And so these things then in turn lead on to increased skills, which lead to decreased risks and also a development of self-confidence and self-esteem. So self-confident and expert children who recognize a mutual respect with the practitioner are potentially children who are more likely to ask for help and advice if they really need it and therefore reduce risk. These skills that they can develop doing a risky activity are potentially transferable. So, you know, the physical um, flexibility, the physical skill, the confidence that they've developed, the knowledge of the environment can be taken out into other environments. And perhaps more importantly, the knowledge that you can learn, can enjoy, can discover in outdoor green and blue spaces is transferable. How am I doing for time, Deborah? You're fine. Yeah, you're fine. So in, terms of, in terms of mental health, young people will develop confidence and skills in accessing outdoor green spaces to be in nature and get those PET, ART, biophilia benefits from the peace of um, the space that's afforded, the grounding that they might experience of being in nature. So you've got that kind of accessing nature as an ongoing resource benefit, but also, as I keep sort of banging on about, you've got this development of con uh, confidence and self-esteem from developing new skills. And this in itself is going to have improvements to young people's mental well-being and resiliency in other environments those are that's a kind of sense of being that can be taken back into the classroom so what happens when we don't allow young people to do these things um, this is a picture and I realise that I'm kind of tight for time given the other things I wanted to say, but um, this is a picture that for me really well illustrates kind of risk management gone mad. This is a picture taken at uh, outdoor activity centre um, for school groups. And you can see the space where the young people are standing is a space in a wood. Although if you look at the ground, you wouldn't know that. I mean, this could be a concrete car park for all the kind of wild wildlife, for all the sort of um, biodiversity there is where they're standing. The other side of the fence looks like woodland and this is fenced off. These kids are taking part in what was billed as a den building activity. But the materials that they were allowed to use for den building were heavily sanded um, and very kind of uniform pieces of wood, which they were only allowed to build into the shape of a den once they'd had their design pre-approved by the activity leader. Unsurprisingly, the kids, or unsurprisingly to me, the kids got bored quite quickly. These were learning disabled teenagers um, and they started to head to the fence. They started to try and climb over the fence because they wanted to explore the wood. So I found myself observing a woodland den building activity that actually descended into adults trying to stop young people going off and exploring some woodland. So what's happening here is that through kind of risk prevention, young people's skills are not developed. They're not really learning anything about the woodland or about building. Um, and so the risk to them of the woodland remains.
and the young people's knowledge is not developed. So both those kind of tangible real risks remain, but also imaginary risks. They don't know that there aren't goblins in the wood because they haven't been allowed to go into the wood and sort of not be eaten by them. And young people miss out on opportunities to develop positive social relationships. Those leaders were there saying no. They were there kind of instructing. They were there giving out rules. Um, this wasn't this wasn't fun. And they miss out on opportunities for developing self-confidence and self-esteem. So the outdoors is sanitized. It's not exciting. It's not a challenging space to be in. It becomes perceived as boring. Um, and imaginary excitement or dangers may well fill in the blanks. What they don't know about nature, um, they kind of think, think of things for themselves, which are likely to be far worse, far more scary than what actually is out there. So how do we better understand percep perception of risk and therefore work to reduce risk aversion in favor of measured and proportionate risk management? So I came up with this little picture um, that I think describes the way that um, teachers, that facilitators might think about risk in relation to engaging young people with an activity in an outdoor green space. And that is a calculation that involves thinking about how risky the young people are and the young people's actions, how likely is a young person to do something silly, to not follow instructions, and then how dangerous is the environment? And by that, I also mean the kind of activity going on in the environment. And so it's young people plus environment, the risk of each that leads to a perception of the total risk. So I suggest that one way of reducing this perception of risk is by increasing knowledge of the environment. And through an increased knowledge of the environment, we can reduce mythical fears, reduce misapprehension about what might be out there. Um, and we can come up with ways of managing risk without preventing activities. So in other words, leading to a better identification of the actual or real objective tangible dangers of spaces and an ability to avoid the kind of real dangers on a micro scale. Um, so to sort of give an example again here, um, to the uninitiated, un uninitiated this picture um, is of an eight-year-old girl who's been let loose on a sharp knife and a bit of wood. But those of you who've kind of done a bit of forest school may well recognize other things going on in this picture. You might be able to recognize the fact that she's holding the knife in a way that means if she slips with the knife, she's not going to cut herself. You can see that there's nobody close to her um, who might sort of trip into her. So this is a kind of example of doing an activity that to somebody that lacks experience and lacks knowledge, might be might appear to be really dangerous but actually through increased knowledge we can kind of remove the micro dangers and still kind of be able to do that activity however i don't think this theory applies quite so neatly to reducing the perceived risk of the young people because preconceived knowledge of young people's behaviors skills and interests is not necessarily particularly helpful if that preconceived knowledge comes from their behavior in a classroom or in another setting. And this is something that I was interested to sort of hear come up briefly yesterday. Um, young people can behave very differently in outdoor green spaces. The kind of naughty kid, the kid that's really difficult to manage in the classroom may well be the one that is excited and well behaved and really keen to get going and follow instructions outdoors. You know, and vice versa, the kid that's really good in the classroom is not necessarily the one that takes naturally to these spaces. So what's important is encouraging an openness to allowing and facilitating, um, observing young people's engagement with nature and ensuring the knowledge that is used in that equation, the knowledge that is used in that graph for calculating the risk is a knowledge that is based on young people's engagement with the outdoors. So finally, how to move forward. I think 
as practitioners, as researchers, recognizing and being good at communicating the benefits of risk. So understanding the mental health benefits, but also, you know, the physical health benefits, the social, the developmental benefits of taking risks and being able to communicate those really clearly to the people that are trying to stop us doing these activities with young people. And I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that that is far easier said than done. And then encouraging environmental knowledge building amongst school teachers, amongst the people that are responsible for the kind of day to day looking after of young people, that they can do these things for themselves and demonstrating positive engagement with children and young people risk taking an outdoor green space. Thanks. <laughs>